This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use the discount code MACVOICES. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac Community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, the road to Macworld continues on, this time for his very first time on Mac Voices. I'm happy to welcome Renee Ritchie of iMore. Renee, thanks for being here. It's great to see you. Thank you for inviting me. It's, I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, we, we've tried a couple times, and the schedule's never worked out, and so Macworld, iWorld seems to be the perfect time to make sure that you get here and get in front of my audience and have a little fun at discussing what you're going to be discussing. Absolutely. I mean, Macworld iWorld, it used to be this big Apple-centric event, you know, giant Apple booth, giant Apple keynote, and everything else got drowned out. But for the last couple of years, it's really been the heart and soul of the Mac and now the iOS community. And that's, I mean, there's, there's no better cause than that. It's been an interesting transition to watch. Everybody was really worried about it when Apple left. And, and I, you know, I hated to see him go. But at the same time, I actually think I like it better now. I abs now I, I understand that maybe Macworld's coffers feel differently than I do, but I absolutely like it far better. I mean, you get to see so many. There's the it's like the, there was this one big tree that was hogging all the sunlight, and now that it's gone, all the little flowers can bloom. Yeah, great, great, great analogy. <laughs> great analogy. I think I'll steal that. <laughs> I know I live for cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get to the topics, I want to just talk for a second about you and what you do. Sure. Because you apparently don't sleep. Um, you you put out more content in more areas, and interestingly, not just Mac areas either. Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, I don't know how deeply you want me to go, but the, the basic idea is I work for a network called Mobile Nations, and we originally started off as Visor Central back in the handspring Visor days. And, you know, that became Trio Central, that became uh, Pre-Central, and then and eventually we started adding Crackberry.com and WM Experts, that, that's now Windows Phone Central. And along the way, we, we started an iPhone site, which was phone different and is now iMore. Uh, and we sort of try to keep our, our hands on the pulse of the mobile mobile community. And Apple, over the span of the last eight years, has become absolutely the dominant mindshare uh, leader in mobile, uh, which is interesting because you have the established Mac community, you have the established mobile community, and then you have everyone who rushed in because, oh, wow, money. So it's a, <laughs> it's a very diverse sort of community. Yeah, well, and, and that's you know, that's a series of sites, but you also do one or two podcasts. Yeah, so my day my day job is I'm editor-in-chief of iMore, so we do a lot of sort of news, reviews, help and how-to content. And then I just love podcasting, so I originally did the iMore show, which was the iMore, you know, the podcast that went with the website. But we started adding some more. I got together with the friends of mine, Mark Edwards and Seth Clifford, and we started Iterate for mobile designers. And then I hoodwinked Guy English of Singleton and Nap fame into doing debug for developers with me. And then I started doing vector for sort of analysis and Zen and tech for lifestyle. And I, we managed to rope Don Melton, who was former Safari technology lead for Apple into doing a podcast about 80s movies with us. I mean, so the, the uh, diversity is, is endless. I think I counted six. <laughs> there that, may be, yeah. Is maybe. that right? Uh, you, you don't sleep. That it just, I guess you just don't have time. You know. I, sh I shut down for periodic recharging, I think, is the best analogy I have. Okay. <laughs> well, so with all that, you bring a very diverse background to Macworld and to the topics that you have chosen. And I've, I'm not sure which one you would like to start with, so I'm going to pick one and say, let's start with your iCloud session. Um, iCloud is just such a hot topic in so many ways, and some would say it's a hot topic good, and some would say it's a hot topic bad. What's your take going to be on it at this session? So that this is thanks to Paul Kent, because he actually chose this topic for me. I wasn't <laughs> sure what to... He, he wanted me to do some sort of instructional segment, and I wasn't sure what to do, because there's just so many topics now. So he threw iCloud at me, and it actually made a lot of sense, because... 
it is it's it's not really Apple's third operating system, but it's kind of Apple's new uh, ecosystem, and so many things tie into it. And it's it's very confusing because Apple uses the name iCloud to represent a bunch of really different services that have nothing to do with each other except the fact that they all live in the cloud and have that branding. And I thought that was sort of fascinating because uh, you get complaints that iCloud is great, and you get complaints that it doesn't work at all. And the truth is, some of the stuff is fantastic, like the email based on IMAPs, rock solid, uh, the CalDAV, the calendar stuff, all that kind of stuff, the basic personal information management stuff is really solid, but then you dive into it and there's things like uh, iTunes in the cloud, which lets you re-download your apps and movies. But then there's this other segment where developers can start syncing your key values and your core data and do all these other things. And now iWork is in the iCloud and keychains are in the iCloud. And it, it's just such an array of very different things that I think it's not always obvious what works, when it works, and how it all works together. And and that's a concern, like you said, when it works, if it works. And the, I hate that fact because, you know, you want it all to work. And if you're not sure if it, if it does or when it does or if it will, then you really hesitate to adopt it and look for some other solutions or just say, it's not there yet, I'll wait until it gets there. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I think because... Uh, I, I think there's a price to be paid for simplicity. Simplicity has to be close to 100% or people get very nervous. It's nice to tell them you don't have to worry. Toggle this on and just let it work. But then when it stops working, they have no, they're, not, they're not expecting it and they have no way of handling it. It's that famous joke about, P, about you know, Windows PC versus Mac problem solving. On a Windows PC, the answer is always yes, but on the Mac, it's like, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, you know. Maybe it's yes, maybe it's no. Let's... Let's try and dig under the covers. And that's really true. I think, you know, your backups are going great until suddenly your camera roll or your iMessages has clogged it full and you, you can no longer back up your device. And then how does a normal person know to go in and fix that? And I think that's the sort of stuff that can be that we can help easily sort of assuage that and give people tools to get better at using it. And so this will be the focus of your session using iCloud effectively? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're going to define what iCloud is. We're going to look at the pain points, you know, the most common ways in which it causes people strife and misery. And we're going to try and give you really easy or digestible ways to sort of get in there and handle it. Strife and misery. Okay, well, that may be a little much. But, you know, you make a real good point that you and I and, and a lot of the people listening to this might know, okay, I need to go in and delete some photos or do this or do that. A lot of people are just going to say, it doesn't work. Here, somebody fix it for me or I don't know who to call. Or well, they'll just stop you. I mean, like the backup is fantastic. You turn it on, it backs up all your stuff, but you get that warning saying, we're no longer backing your stuff up because it's full. And a lot of people just stop there and they never have a backup again, uh, yeah. which is tragic. Yeah. Yeah. And it becomes more tragic when something really happens that they need it. Absolutely. And that's when the tragedy really strikes. <laughs> so well, that, that, it, it should be a great session. I'm, and I'm glad to see that iCloud is included in, in the sessions uh, because it, it is such a great asset if you know how to use it, and if you know which of the services you can really depend on. I mean, I am all in on iCloud. I used to sync my... We forget how fast things change sometimes. I used to be, like everybody, beholden to iTunes. Uh, you'd have to plug your thing in. It would move your apps around. It would change things. Uh, and it, it was always causing me consternation. I haven't used iTunes to sync anything, I think, in two or three years. And I love the freedom that iCloud gives me. It's almost magical. If you walk in and swap your phone out at Apple and you put in your Apple ID, you can leave with a virtual duplicate of your original phone. Uh, but it's, it's those little gotchas that we just want to make go away for you. Renee, before we leave this topic, I'm curious, and this may not be fair, but percentage-wise, how, how far away is a full iCloud utilization? And, and, and maybe I should say it this way. How much can you rely on iCloud? You can rely on iCloud if you are fairly tech savvy and it is part of a larger uh, system that you that you use. You know, for example, if you're used to backing things up in other ways, uh, or you're just not like you're, you 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 loosely hold on to how your apps look. If you're not that demanding of the service, then it's fantastic. If you have very precise needs, iCloud is a general service and it will cause you some friction. Good answer. Good answer. So when is this session? I, I believe this session is on the Thursday. I, I'm terrible and don't have it in front of me. Yeah, that's okay. But and I believe it's Thursday around 3 p.m. 
And folks, there has been a little bit of shuffling around of, of some of the sessions, as there always is. You know, people have other commitments, things come up. So as we talk about this, you know, make sure that you go right before the show and double check where everybody's sessions are. That's going to be a good thing to do. And I'm sure Macworld and everyone will be publicizing them during the event, too. Oh, yeah. 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 They will get the signage right, definitely. <laughs> um, this many weeks out still, it can get a little bit crazy. So, Ray, your other session, I think, is the one that I want to spend the most time on because it's a new technology. It's sort of a debated technology, and that's iBeacons. Yeah, iBeacons, it's so fascinating to me, and I'm, I'm kind of lumping them together in this group of new technologies that we're getting into. And I should just warn people in advance that my background is in product marketing. Before I got into journalism, I was the guy who was pitching and evangelizing products. So I tend to get really excited about technology things. Uh, and I think that kind of it, 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 there's always this translation product uh, project uh, sorry process. I used to joke that when I was in product marketing, my job was to translate between developers and salespeople, so that salespeople didn't try to sell things that didn't exist, and developers didn't try to make things that couldn't be sold. And sort of when you get into journalism, it's still a translation job because you have to take these products. And yes, some companies like Apple are very good at explaining what they feel like explaining. Other companies are horrible at messaging. But you have to take all this stuff and sort of make it digestible for you your readers. It's your job to listen to everything that's told you and then present it in a way that makes sense to your readers. And I think nothing is as important as the future technologies because in some ways they're going to invade our privacy, which will make us nervous. In some ways they try to take over tasks that we're used to doing on our own. You know, it's a level of automation that might make us nervous. And I think when you group them all together, when you start having your location mapped and you start having, uh, you know, virtual presences try to intercede on your shopping. I think there's a level of stress that comes with that. And I think that's the value of sessions like these as we can sort of talk as human beings about what it all means to us. Boy, you just, you said a mouthful there. Um, <laughs> Sorry. And so, so let's go back for a second and just explain what I, what I beacons are. And there's no sorry about it. It's <laughs> the passion really shows through, but, but what are I beacons and how, how are they starting to affect us? Uh, so I'd like to I want to frame this sort of in the in the greater context of sensors for Apple because the iPhone has always been a device with sensors. Even when Steve Jobs first introduced it, he showed us that demo about how you know it could change orientation based on the accelerometer. It could turn itself off based on the proximity detector. Uh, the touchscreen could feel our fingers. Never mind a stylus. It could feel the electricity in your fingers and know what you were tapping. So these devices have always had this awareness about them, and Apple's been adding to it. They added gyros scopes and they added you know, GPS to it. Uh, and year after year, they've been giving it this ability to, to sort of sense their environment better. And some of the best recent examples are Siri. Before Siri, the microphone was just a dumb microphone. But with Siri now, it's it can understand uh, synque so the best way to put it, it understands context and it can do the sequential parsing. So if you start talking to it, it remembers the last thing you said or the last series of things and sort of knows to continue that conversation. Or Touch ID, before we had a dumb home button, but now Touch ID can tell who we are based on our fingerprint. And iBeacon sort of brings that full circle because we had GPS. It could tell me where I was on a road, but once I got into a building, it had no idea where I was anymore. Once I got into a parking lot, it just said, you're yeah, you're in the parking lot. It couldn't help me find a space. If I'm in a national park, it says, hey, welcome to the national park. It doesn't tell me what all the sites are. So things like iBeacon, again, they're adding a level of intelligence. And it's not like the Terminator or the Matrix kind of artificial intelligence we're all afraid of. It's a dumb sort of, it's an awareness more than an intelligence. But Conceivably, things like iBeacon will let our devices interact with us indoors and in specific environments the way they've been doing for years, sort of on highway systems and, and in between buildings. This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use the discount code MACVOICES. Making a website is easy, right? All you have to do is find a domain name registrar, buy the domain name, find a web host, and not just any web host, one that has a hosting plan that has enough space and bandwidth for your needs. So you have to figure out what your space and bandwidth needs are first. File your host's information with your registrar so they know where to point the domain. Of course, you'll have to do that yourself, because they expect you to know how to do that. 
Then, figure out what kind of software you're going to use to run your website. Something that you code on your computer and upload, or some type of platform that runs on the host servers. If it's the former, then you need to buy the software, learn the software, then start building your site. If it's the latter, you need to decide what platform suits your needs, and that means knowing what your needs are, then figuring out if your host has it available, and if they do, if they will install it for you, or if you need to install it yourself, or if you need to hire someone to install it. And then you can start thinking about what your site looks like and what you want it to contain. Of course, you'll have to dig through all sorts of options and either learn a little coding yourself or hire someone else to do it for you so your site can look just right. And all of that should take you somewhere around a month, a month and a half, if you're very, very, very lucky. I'm not sure about you, but that's not my version of Easy. My version of Easy is Squarespace. Squarespace, where you sign up for a 14-day free trial with just your email address. That takes about 15 seconds. Then, pick a template so that you'll have some idea of how your site will look. That may take a little more time, since there are so many great options. Even if you pick one and then want to change it later, no problem. So let's give you 30 minutes to play with the templates. Take another 90 seconds to fill in all your social media accounts. And then another 30 seconds to include a contact form. Not sure you're up to all this? Squarespace has some great video workshops that will answer any questions you have. Even if we throw watching the Getting Started workshop into the mix, that's another 45 minutes. And your site is up, running, functional, and ready for the world to have a look-see. Oh, the domain name? No problem, Squarespace can hook you up directly. So let's see, by my count that's about 90 minutes of your time to get up and running with Squarespace, including a coffee break. And you did it yourself, and it was fun. Don't you owe it to yourself to dedicate an hour or so trying out Squarespace before you waste a month or more on another platform? Or 336 hours? That's how long the 14-day free trial runs, so you can really dig in and make your site exactly the way you want it. Then, before the clock strikes 337, sign up with the discount code MACVOICES and get 10% off your bright, shiny new site that you put together. That's 10% off your new Squarespace site with the code MACVOICES. Just think, your site could be online by lunch, or dinner, or breakfast. It just depends on when you start. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. And some of the uses that iBeacons are being put to, I mean, they're, they're really intriguing. I can see the, the positive side very easily, where they're going to guide me or let me know where I am, help me find things or places that I want to go. In, in a macro sense, say in a stadium, or in a more micro sense, in, in a store, you know, that, okay, the, the Coca-Cola is in the back left corner. Great. You know, that, that'll definitely help. Um, but you're, you're right. They do present a potential in, invasion into our privacy, because in order to let us know where other things are, they have to know where we are in relation to those things. Absolutely. So the way an iBeacon works, is it's a Bluetooth 4.0 low energy device. And that means that it has, it's a radio. There's a, there's a radio in your phone that is doing that. And because the radio is also in your phone, every iOS device that has Bluetooth 4.0, which is the iPhone 4S, uh, and I believe the iPad 3 and up, is an iBeacon. So the minute you have one of these devices, you yourself become an iBeacon. You become part of the network, the Internet of Things, which is, I think, what the kids are calling it these days. And you, so it's a two way connection. And, you know, if I'm coming to visit you, Chuck, and I've never been to your office before, theoretically, an iBeacon can say, not only this is the parking lot of your office, but the next available empty parking space is three cars down and to the left. And then, oh, Chuck's office is on the fifth floor, room 5.0, and it'll lead me exactly to your door but it can also i can enter into a store and it can say hey you yes you you look like a five large we have three of those on the rack right now 25 percent off you'd look great in those and then as i get closer it could say yeah it's on this rack. And, and that is almost like that minority report sort of uniquely targeted advertising that sounds great in theory but can, can that, but can quickly become alienating or overwhelming uh, in practice if we're not careful 
if we're not careful. So how do you how do you control this? Because you know, with all due respect to your former profession, <laughs> marketers sometimes get a little too enthusiastic because they think that whatever their product is, it's the greatest thing in the world, and they want everybody to know about it twenty four seven three sixty five. And if you don't believe me, folks, witness you know your your email spam as a small example. So how do we control this? So, so yeah, so there's this thing, um, just to understand why that happens, there's this thing in retail called um, next best offer. So the, the theory is, if I just said, here's $25 free, everyone in the world would take that coupon. If I'm giving out 25 bucks in cash, that coupon would get near 100% redemption. You'd have to be really lazy not to spend your $25. So a, a retailer always wants to figure out the least amount they can give you that will get you to spend the most amount. And having you captive in their store looking at things is a super attractive offer to them, especially because they know so much about us now because, you know, maybe, you know, Google ads follow us everywhere and we share location data. We share all these different things. The the nice thing is that so far, Apple has made it really easy. You can actually just turn off iBeacons in the settings. You can go to your privacy, you can switch it off, and then it's like a stone wall. Nothing can get you. It doesn't know where you are and you can't talk to it. It is absolutely a firewall in between. What we don't know about yet is how granular it would be. For example, if I want to use iBeacons, if, uh, for example, I'm blind, but I want to go through a national park and I want a guided tour, uh, whether I can enable that but not enable the constant offers for snack chips or water or whatever goes with it as I'm walking down those trails. That's the kind of thing we're going to have to watch. And I think companies are going to have to balance and measure the sentiment that they get back. You know, how, whether our level of frustration versus our level of glee and sort of adjust accordingly. <laughs> yeah, almost like a, a spam filter for iBeacons or those, that kind of information. Yeah, and it's going to be similar to spam because the reason spam exists is because I think like 0.01% of people respond to it. And that's enough that it pays for all the spam that goes out. So if there is incredibly heavy-handed uh, iBeacon or any other similar technology, because Google's deploying the same thing and a lot of other companies are investigating it too, if people respond to the heavy-handedness of it enough that it makes people money to do it, <laughs> they'll do it. And that's a scary thing because if if this gets good enough, and it will, that it does say, yeah, hey, you look good in that, and you think, yeah, you know, I would look good in that. And I respond to it, whether I should have or not, whether I really wanted to or not, that's going to put a, a dollar in the coffers of hit them with everything you got. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's Homer Simpson redeeming those free donuts and beer is, you know, going, woohoo, is going to curse us all. <laughs> Another interesting example. <laughs> So, so what is your going to be your approach? Introduce iBeacons, be afraid of iBeacons, embrace iBeacons. What, what's your take on it? So, I'm going to address it in the terms of a contextual awakening because we've had, even though we've had these smartphones and smart tablets and things for years, they haven't been really smart. They've they've been sort of two way data connections, but they haven't really understood us and they haven't really understood the world around us. And based on the sensors that they're getting, and we'll probably get into a little bit about things like the iWatch and iOS eight and the health initiatives that are going with it, they're going to understand us to a much greater level. Uh, And then we're going to talk a little bit, um, and I remember this fondly, I remember talking to Ford a couple of years ago at CES, and they said, you know, what we can do with cars now is insane, but we just can't release them because they would scare the heck out of people. No one would get behind the wheel, so we have to, like, one model can get the parallel parking, another model can get the we'll find you in parking lots, and we've got to walk people very carefully, step by step, through this. And I think Apple's doing something similar. You know, Passbook doesn't do a lot yet. Touch ID doesn't do a lot yet. But it lets us get comfortable with the idea of using a Starbucks card on our phone or using our fingerprint to authorize an iTunes purchase. And I think Apple is uniquely positioned because their main revenue stream doesn't depend on this, that they can take their time and sort of start our boiling in the cold water. You know, (laughs) go with that analogy. Do you think, though, that they're... For people like us, they're moving too slow they're, because we're always ready for the next thing beyond the next thing. Uh, do you think that we, they really need to be as careful as they are? And, and I'm thinking Apple and, okay, so Ford and, you know, some of the other companies out there that are doing bigger things like cars. Uh, or do you think that, that the whole – we've all caught up with the future a little bit and, and we may not get flying cars, but it would be nice to have self-driving cars. 
Uh, yeah, I think that's true to an extent, and I think it depends whether you're playing a short-term game or a long-term game. For example, other companies have fingerprint uh, sensors, but we don't know as much about that. Either it's the, they're using older technology or they just haven't elaborated on their technology. And it's become clear from Apple's methodology that they thought through Touch ID to an incredible extent, and they really prioritized security. And they're taking it slow because, you know, things like AntennaGate, yeah, they can be frustrating, but that was just, you know, a reception. If our wallets ever got compromised, our trust level would really plummet. So when when it affects people on that sort of a visceral level, I think it behooves Apple to move slowly. And I, I, that's why I like companies like Samsung too, because they're like the crazy uncle of mobile. They throw everything at the wall. And yes, some of it falls flat, but some of it sticks. And for the, the state of technology moves forward a little bit faster because of them. And I like that we have companies that are more conservative and we have companies that are sort of wilder in nature. And I think the balance will fall somewhere in between. Uh, that's really interesting, Renee, and I never really thought about it exactly like that. I guess the thing that I feel, uh, as, a, as a consumer, a little frustrated with is that, yeah, they throw some of this great stuff out, and if it if it works for me, that's great, but if it falls flat, I've wasted my money, I've tried to start relying on something that doesn't pan out. And I feel like that's the one thing about Apple that, for the most part, not if, not you know, we can always find ex- uh, exceptions, but for the most part, if Apple brings something out, they're going to stick with it for a while and not let it go. Uh, you know, I think that's absolutely true. I think it depends on our personal nature. For example, uh, companies like Samsung, HTC, some of those companies, they don't just do one crazy thing. They do a hundred crazy things. And of those things, yes, 90% will fall flat. But you'll probably, the type of person who would buy those products is probably happy with the 10%. For example, they had large screen phones three years ago, and they got about two hours of battery life. But hey, you had an LTE radio and a large screen phone. And for some people, that's all that really mattered because, hey, big and fast. Uh, and they managed to get that, and, and it would take Apple, you know, maybe three, four years before they were willing to, be, not willing, before they had the chipset and screen technology where they felt it was a great experience to have it. So I'm happy waiting because I really value those things, like really good quality display, really energy efficient. Other people said, no big, now fast, want it. You know, and we both we both got to be happy in our own context. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I think everybody here that's watching this has that i wanted now gene yeah i think we're kind of stuck with that well i mean it's, it's the repercussions right so uh in 2012 um Apple put out the iPad Mini, and they put out the iPad 3 and the iPad 4, and they had to compromise. You could have a retina display, you could have long battery life, or you could have a light iPad, and you could only have two of those three things. So you got the uh, iPad Mini that was non-retina, but it was really light and had 10 hours of battery life, and you got the iPad 4, which was retina, had great battery life, but it was heavier than the iPad 2. You fast forward to 2013, and now with the retina iPad Mini and the iPad Air, Apple figured out how to do all three of those things. So both of those have a retina screen, both of those are really light, and both of them have 10 hours of battery life. So it it took Apple a couple of years to get to that point in technology, but a lot of us wouldn't have been happy with, you know, a two-hour battery life tablet that weighed three pounds. So we're waiting, but we're not horribly upset while we're waiting. Well, we all have that that issue that no matter how long the iPhone battery lasts, it's never long enough. No matter how long the MacBook Air battery lasts, it's never long enough. Thank you. Can I have double? Yeah. Yeah. It's again, that's just it. But there are plenty of people out there living their lives quite happily with just what they have now. And that's, that's tough for us to remember. Well, you and I remember, you know, on iBook, how much, you know, the quality of that screen and how much battery life that got. And we, uh, even the first, the first generation iPhone and iPad, no 3G, let alone no LTE, you know, it got a, got a little bit of battery life with a really low res screen. We've come so far so quickly. Yeah. Well, and you think about how long the iPhone's been around. It hasn't been around that long. And when I think about what life was like before that, I, I feel like I'm looking back at the Stone Age. I had a Trio. It cost me $30 to get a, a Sticky Notes app, and it crashed every time I launched it. Yep. <laughs> yep. And I had plenty of cell phones before that that they – what horrors. They were only phones. I mean, you know. And they fit, it took a briefcase to power them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, these sound like a couple very compelling sessions uh, that you're going to be doing on the on the conference track. Anything else going on for you at MacWorld, iWorld, other than obviously just trying to hit the show for what cover products, meet people, go to parties? Yeah, so uh, I 
I believe the the contextual awakening uh, talk is gonna, the I Beacon talk is going to be on the Friday. On Saturday, Peter Cohen and I are going to be doing the I More show from somewhere in the Macworld uh, floor. Um, so if you want to hear our take on how the week went, you're welcome to come there and join us. Uh, and other than that, we'll be wandering around, you know, talking to developers, talking to accessory makers, uh, talking to fellow journalists and podcasters, and all that fun stuff. You and you and Peter together? That should, yes, that should be interesting. Uh, I, I believe he's still required by law to have at least one chaperone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's I, I honestly forgot that that Peter now is working over at Imore and he's doing a great job. He's putting out a lot of stuff. Yeah, he's you know he, he's our managing editor. He's handling most of the Mac coverage, uh, and he he is not reserved about sharing his opinion. But it's an opinion informed by far more decades of knowledge than he would like for me to admit on this program. <laughs> and and I have to say one thing about Peter is he, you're right. He's not bashful about his opinions, but he can back them up, and mm-hmm. he comes to things from very unusual angles. When you sit there and say, you know, that's a really good point, and I hadn't thought about it. Well, the thing I love best about Peter, and it's a thing that we try to do in iMore in general, is we, you know, in like high school math terms, we want to show our work. So if someone says there's a security exploit, we want to see, does it really affect, you know, our parents or our friends, our people who aren't that techie? How does it, does it really hurt them? If someone says Apple has abandoned Snow Leopard, as they did last week, Peter goes and looks and says, uh, no, as a matter of fact, that's not true. So you shouldn't be panicking about that sort of a thing. And that's, I think, you know, the, the value that someone like Peter brings is that he, there's, there's, there's a lot of, he can give you a contextual opinion. He can give you a really informed opinion about something. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to Macworld. I hope you are. I, how many have you been to? My first one was the Phil Schiller keynote Macworld. I missed the year before, sadly. Okay. And, and once you, are you one of those that once you started, you never missed one? No, I, I've been going straight since 2009, I think that was. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it becomes a bit of an addiction. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you, you not only do you get to, again, it's the pulse of the community, not only do you get to see everyone that you spend all year talking to over email or, or over Skype, you get to meet them in person, you get to talk to them, but you get to meet everyone else who's excited um, about the community. Uh, and for me, it's funny because um, I didn't mention it at the beginning, and I should have, I do Mac Break Weekly with Leo Laporte, uh, and that's an incredibly different group of viewers than I enjoy on, on iMore. And meeting all these people and the diverse backgrounds they have and how they came to technology, uh, it's, it's eye-opening. It gives me a better idea of the kind of work that I need to do. And that's just invaluable for me. So, I, oh, I knew there was one other thing I did want to mention, and I should have done it at the top of the show, like you. Um, you served on the Macquarie World uh, Industry Advisory Board this year. Yes. So your opinions helped shape the show, and you know, you've, you've, you had the chance to give some input. So thank you for that. You know, I know it's going to be a great show, and I can't wait to get there, and I can't wait to see you in person. Likewise, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to Macworld more and more each year, which if you told me that back when Apple left, I would have said, ah, that'll be hard to prove, but it, it really is coming true. Just I think the, the work that Paul Kent and his team are putting in and the sort of event that they're building is not so much about Apple, but about all of us who use and love and live you know, based on the devices that Apple provides. And that, to me at least, is far more valuable. Yeah, agreed. Well, Renee, I'll see you there. Thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. And we got to get you back when we're not just talking Macworld I World, but we can riff on a few other th- topics. Absolutely. Anytime. Great. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. We will be at Macworld I World. Renee, me, Peter, and a whole lot of other people you've seen here. We want you there too. So until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com. For links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, app.net, Google+, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date with all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Backbeat.